Welcome back to the, the second day of our Pennsylvania Farm Show Agricultural Law Symposium. Uh, the, the, the program for today, uh, we once again will be following this, the same pattern where we, where we uh, have a, our first session from one o'clock to two o'clock. We'll have a 15 minute break and then our second session will be from 2.15 to 3.15. The, the first session today will, will be taking three topics that are all really related to uh, additional income opportunities or potential additional income opportunities for, for farmers. Uh, we'll talk about agritourism immunity, about carbon contracts and markets, and about, about solar development. Uh, after the break in our second session, we will talk about some of the, the major environmental issues that are affecting agriculture. Talk about pesticides, uh, Chesapeake Bay, issues and then the, the ever-present waters of the, of the United States. Now, for those of you who were not um, able to join us on, on Tuesday, uh, we will be posting the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the recording from both days. Uh, next week, we'll be posting that on, on the center's YouTube channel. And the, uh, the, the content that we covered on Tuesday, uh, the first hour focused on uh, the year in review, looking at, at developments from last year, as well as looking at uh, issues that were pending before the, the Supreme Court this year. So kind of looking back and, and looking forward. And then our second session dealt with two topics, um, important timely topics in agricultural markets. The first topic being geographical in indications, uh, which is a, a, a major topic in international trade uh, in, in, of particular importance to the dairy industry. And then we also address the antitrust issues in, in that session. A as I mentioned, uh, this, the, uh, the session today is being recorded and the, the link for the recording will be posted on YouTube next week. I think we'll be mailing, uh, mailing the, emailing that out to you when, when that is available. Um, the, the materials for today's session as, as well as Tuesday's session are available on the, uh, on the Ag Law Center's um, events page or on the events page specifically for, for this event for the Pennsylvania Farm Show. Ag Law Symposium. If you have any questions during the, uh, the program, please use the, uh, the Q&A uh, feature of, uh, of, of, of the webinar and uh, we'll answer your questions at, at the end of each session. If you, uh, if you do have any, any questions, um, technical questions, uh, you can email uh, uh, Jackie Schweikler at jks251 at psu.edu. Okay, for those of, of you who are attorneys looking for CLE credits, the uh, the form will be posted um, in the uh, in the chat box, um, and uh, it'll be posted because Jackie's normally the one who posts that. So so Jackie will probably post that after her presentation is done because she'll be speaking first. Uh, we will provide a code word as we've done in other programs for each hour. Um, you will be given a code word that you need to put on on that form. Okay, I want to I want to thank our, uh, our our partners that provide support for our programs, um, the, uh, the 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 Commonwealth, uh, the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture for the support that that they provide to us, and also the uh, the National Agricultural Law Center and the National Ag Library. on On Tuesday, we had Secretary Russell Redding uh, provide provide a few a few words um, a, a few words. Um, for us to open our program, and uh, and today we have with us the director of the of the National Agricultural Law Center to uh, to pro to to uh, give us a few words to open our event. So uh, the director of the National Agricultural Law Center is is Harrison Pittman. Harrison has been a director for <clears throat> probably close to to fifteen years now. Um, <clears throat> Harrison speaks uh, widely on a variety of issues across the across the country. Um, without further ado, I'll turn it over to, uh, to Harrison. Thanks, Ross. I appreciate that and uh, appreciate the opportunity to be with you guys today um, uh, for the next few minutes. And if you hear, you may hear some like electric guitar in the background. That's what virtual education sounds like in my household right now. Uh, our kids have been sent home and apparently uh, there is no class right now because my youngest is in there thrashing around electric guitar, so forgive that. Uh, so I'm Harrison Pittman. I serve as director of the National Agricultural Law Center, as Ross mentioned. 
Um, and uh, I think this is such a great program. Uh, the topics that were listed are, are, are just really on point. And Ross mentioned, you know, I've been director roughly 15 years. I, that, I have to do the math, but I think that's on point. I've been at the National Ag Law Center since 2001. Um, and the reason I mentioned that is just in that time period, I've, I've had a front row seat uh, just to see how much the issues have changed in all these years and uh, and where we've come from and you know the issues that I would see commonly then a lot of basically issues that reflected the fallout of the farm crisis of the 1980s uh, those those types of issues financing credit secure transactions and so forth bankruptcy those are all still very important but look at the agenda you have today you know from agritourism and the legal liability laws I can remember when there were no liability laws at the state level and uh, in the last few years well over half the states in the country have passed some type of liability protection. Others have advanced to programs to, to help promote it within their state. Certainly the world of pesticides from uh, pe uh, dicamba and glyphosate, clopyrifos, and I, I was so glad to see those items on the agenda. Um, that has so much to do with just the future of the ag industry as a whole and uh, and just the, the regulatory and litigation environment and how those have changed so much. Um, carbon, you know, that's not a new idea. Credit trading's not new, but the the world has just continued to change in this and the political impetus to to move in this area and emerging of the private sector and the public sectors and government uh, and, and so much. And agriculture really is the one place that the needle can be moved there. And of course, solar uh, and, and waters of the United States and all those kinds of issues that the WOTUS has never gone away, it's only changed. And, you know, we, we could come back in five years and we'll still be talking about the latest with WOTUS. But um, I, I really appreciate the program that, and, and really appreciate the leadership that, that Ross has provided through the Center for Agricultural and Shale Law. Um, you know, I'll close with just saying that, you know, the center, the National Agricultural Law Center, our mission is to serve as the nation's leading source for agricultural and food law research and information. And it's really important to us and our success is, is having great partners, great strategic partners. And, and, and the Center for Agricultural and Shell Law is, is a key part of that for us. It, it helps us serve our stakeholders around the country in being able to provide objective and relevant, timely research and information that producers and attorneys and other professionals in agriculture can, can use and, and, and to help promote and protect the industry that we all work for and, and work in. And so I appreciate the opportunity. I'll close there and, uh, and Ross, I uh, congratulate you on a, on a great agenda, both Tuesday and today. And, and Jackie and Brooke and, and Chloe as well. I don't want to leave anybody else out, but uh, I really appreciate the opportunity and uh, uh, look forward to the program. Thanks a lot, Harrison. And so our, the, the, the first uh, session, we will be addressing uh, agritourism um, immunity liability. And, uh, and our speaker is a staff attorney at the, at the center, Jack, Jackie Schweigler. So uh, Jackie, turn it, turn it over to you. All right, uh, thank you so much. I uh, appreciate both introductions. So for this session of the Agricultural Law Symposium, we're going to cover uh, three important issues that affect farm income when it comes to diverse sources, agritourism immunity, carbon contracts and markets, and grid scale solar. Again, my name is Jackie Schweckler, and I'll be talking about agritourism, and then I'll hand things over to uh, Brooke Dewar. So whenever I talk about agritourism, I like to start uh, by showing this data from USDA showing the importance of off-farm income for small farms. Uh, this is their updated chart as of uh, last December. If we zoom in on this chart, we get a better idea of the data that's shown here. Uh, I'm not gonna go into all the details right now, but if you take a look, you can see that off-farm income is pretty much what makes up the total income for a lot of small farms. To me, this represents the clearest picture of why farmers need diverse income. Without it, it'd be difficult, if not impossible, for some small farms to sustain themselves. Okay, so everyone here is probably familiar with some version of agritourism. For those of you who aren't familiar with the term, 
agritourism refers very, very generally uh, to a public recreational on-farm activity. Most of these uh, on the, listed on the slide here uh, should be pretty familiar. So you got things like uh, hay rides, pumpkin patches, corn mazes, you pick operations, you know, you go, you pick the apples, you pick the blueberries, whatever it is, uh, barn weddings, uh, wine tastings at wineries, that sort of thing. Now this list of agritourism activities uh, reflects the broader definition of agritourism. That said, most states have a different legal definition of agritourism, which doesn't always fit, you know, what you might instinctively think of as agritourism. Farmers who are interested in starting an agritourism operation are gonna deal with some complex legal hurdles. Uh, they have to ask questions like, what kind of regulations affect this activity? What sort of liability risks could I face when inviting the public onto my farm? Uh, what can I do to protect myself from this liability? Uh, today, we're gonna to focus on most of our time on the legislative protections that are associated with liability risk. So I'm gonna skip over regulations and zoning, which I normally wouldn't do, but we're just gonna do that for today. So when we talk about liability risks on the farm, the list of risks is endless. Um, on this slide is a short um, list of examples. You got things like uh, equipment. Uh, what if your equipment fails or, you know, it's a farm. So your equipment is just might be just dangerous. Uh, potential problems with the terrain, paths and walkways could become slippery when it's icy, things like that. Um, a very prepared agritourism operator would write down all the potential risks associated with their operation and then write down the types of things they would need to do in order to prevent those risks. For example, uh, the farmer should get a first aid kit, um, put up signs, you know, where you're allowed to go, where you're not allowed to go, uh, do not touch signs on things that could be dangerous. Um, if you're expecting guests in the winter, buy some rock salt, put the rock salt down on the icy pathways. Uh, if you have any dangerous animals, uh, put up extra fencing, put up signs, keep people away from those animals. Uh, they need to take note of the risks and then make a plan to deal with those risks. So no matter how carefully an operator prepares themselves, there's still a risk that they could be liable for someone's injury. One popular method of liability protection includes uh, signed waivers or releases. Uh, whenever I go snowboarding, which is not, not very frequently, uh, I have to sign a waiver agreeing to release the resort from liability. Waivers aren't going to work for everything, but it's a good start. Now, if someone sues, uh, the operator can use assumption of risk as a defense in the event of a negligence lawsuit. To use this as a defense, uh, an operator must make sure that the dangers are very clear to the guests. Operators should make it a policy to ensure that the guests are aware of all dangers. Now I'm gonna talk about the other protections on the slide with a little bit more depth. That includes liability insurance, entity formation, and state liability legislation. So agritourism operations should always consider liability insurance. Most farmers already have farm insurance, but your traditional farm insurance is unlikely to cover the special situations that can arise uh, depending on the operation. Uh, in fact, uh, your municipality might already have uh, requirements for operators to get specific insurance relating to that activity. Either way, uh, cost is a huge consideration. You have to think about how much uh, liability protection you need, how much do you want to spend, how much can you spend, how much can you afford, that sort of thing. And it's important to talk to the insurance company specifically. The operator needs to make sure that the insurance company understands everything that's involved and that they can cover all activities. Some activities that may seem normal to the farmer uh, may not be normal to the insurance company. So agritourism operators should also consider whether entity formation would be appropriate. There are a few different types of entities that can protect businesses from experiencing a significant personal loss in the event of an injury-related lawsuit. I always talk to an attorney to figure out which of these makes the most sense for the operation. When someone's creating an entity, whether it's an LLC or a partnership, they need to think about taxes, the amount of effort involved in maintaining that entity, and how they can transfer the entity to future generations. And perhaps mo most importantly for our discussions here, uh, they should consider liability protection. A corporation or an LLC is going to give you some liability protection. So depending on the agritourism operation, uh, that might be something to consider. Now, state legislation, this is kind of the, the main focus here. Um, a few states have agritourism statutes that don't have anything to do with liability. These statutes sometimes just have uh, definitions or they create permit requirements or zoning rules we're gonna be focusing on the liability-related statutes. 
typically an agritourism liability protection statute is going to limit the liability of an agritourism operator. This means that if someone is injured on an agritourism operator's property, the injured person generally uh, cannot sue the operator for any injuries sustained from an in inherent risk in the activity. As an example, I ask on this slide, what would be an inherent risk at an animal petting zoo? Uh, I think most of us can assume that an animal might bite or kick or even knock you down. Inherent risks are things that should be obvious to anyone in the business. So agritourism operators who live in a state with liability protection statutes, uh, they don't need to be as worried about these sort of injuries, assuming that they're following all the requirements. So most states now have liability protections for agritourism operators. Uh, in order for these protections to apply, most states require operations to fit a specific definition and the state requires operators to post certain signs. Most states don't include an age requirement they define participant as any person other than the agritourism provider who participates in the agritourism activity. Only Georgia requires the participant to be 18 years old in order for the protection to apply to the operator. And I only list age here because the age of the participant can be important when filing a lawsuit. When it comes to the text of the agritourism statutes, it's generally a non-factor. Now, as far as fees go, uh, six states don't mention fees, charges, or compensation at all. The other states, including most of the recent ones, specifically provide liability protection whether or not a fee is charged. In other words, rather than uh, prohibiting protection when an agritourism operation collects a fee, most states affirmatively include protection for fee collecting operations. With that in mind, the only state that does not give liability protections to landowners who charge fees is South Dakota, uh, since the primary purpose of agritourism is usually to diversify farm income, the South Dakota statute is essentially useless. Now, in order for liability protection to apply to an agritourism operation, the, the operator must follow the signage requirement according to their specific state statute. All states require the agritourism professional to post and maintain signs at a clearly visible or conspicuous location. Some states give you the exact language that needs to be on the sign, um, the statute might even say how big the letters need to be. There's been quite a few state updates in recent years that includes new agritourism laws and updates to older laws. This slide shows a handful of some of the more recent ones like Alaska in 2018, Iowa and Pennsylvania in 2021, and Vermont in 2021. And we're gonna be focusing mostly on Pennsylvania. And mostly because we're resuming from Pennsylvania, we're gonna take a deep dive and focus on this state um, so I'm not going to go through the Ohio information here. I only left this slide in so anyone interested could compare our neighbor state statutes with uh, Pennsylvania. Same with New York. I just left this slide here. So if you get the slides later, uh, you can do a little comparison between the two states. You'll also be able to find all the PowerPoints um, from today's presentation on, the, on our website on our events page. I think this PowerPoint's already up, but you can find the other ones um, after the symposium. So for Pennsylvania, on June 30th, 2021, HB 101 was signed into law as Pennsylvania's Agritourism Activity Protection Act. This act became effective at the end of August last year. This new law grants an agritourism activity provider liability protection from civil liability for injury or damages sustained by a third party participant in an agritourism activity. This new law does not apply to all agritourism activities. It's important to note that Pennsylvania's act is different from other state agritourism liability statutes in a few significant ways. Unlike every other state, uh, Pennsylvania specifically excludes liability protections for injuries that occur during weddings or concerts. So an operator who moved to Pennsylvania recently or someone who has uh, business operating on one of these statutes in a different state, they might assume that barn weddings will be covered. Barn weddings are specifically not covered here. In addition, uh, Pennsylvania's act will not apply to injuries sustained during overnight stays or as a result of food and beverage service. Now, in order to receive liability protection, um, the operator has to meet all four of these key elements that I've got on the slide here. Um, they have to meet the specific definition of agritourism for this state. The farm has to qualify as a normal agricultural operation. The farmer needs to have a written agreement signed by the participants, or they need to have tickets uh, issued to the participants, and they need to have signs posted um, around the uh, facility. 
So first, um, we're going to go each through each of those elements in turn. Uh, for the protection to apply, the injury must occur while the visitor is participating in an activity that meets this definition. Uh, according to the definition, you can see that here on the slide, a farm-related tourism or farm-related entertainment activity that takes place on an agricultural land and allows members of the general public, whether or not for a fee, to tour, explore, observe, learn about, participate in, or be entertained by an aspect of agricultural production, harvesting, husbandry, rural lifestyle that occurs on a farm. It's pretty long, but it's also a pretty broad definition. You could see how that would cover a lot of different topics. So I wanted to give you my favorite example of how broad this is. Um, if we're thinking about how we could apply this definition, I like to look at goat yoga because it's so weird. Uh, Pennsylvania's definition requires the activity be on agricultural, lawn, uh, agricultural land. We're going to get to that definition in a second, but let's assume that our goat yoga operation is happening on a qualifying farm. The statute uses the language entertained by an aspect of agricultural production, husbandry, or rural lifestyle. Yoga is certainly a form of entertainment. Uh, goats can be part of uh, an agricultural operation, of course, a husbandry, rural lifestyle. Uh, so when you break it down, um, the definition for Pennsylvania, uh, some of these more unique operations can easily fit Pennsylvania's definition. So the second uh, element or requirement number two, the agritourism activity must occur on land, which is used for a so-called normal agricultural operation. Now for the definition of normal agricultural operation, we go to Pennsylvania's right to farm law. So according to this definition, uh, the activities, practices, equipment, and procedures that farmers adopt or use or engage in the production and preparation for market, poultry, livestock, and their products, um, you can see that, you can read the definition there. Now, the definition of normal agricultural operation is also broad and applies to most farms that grow produce or raise animals. That said, this definition requires the farm to encompass at least 10 acres, or if less than 10 acres, must generate an annual income of $10,000 or more. Now, the third requirement in the Pennsylvania statute is that the visitor must sign an agreement to waive liability before they engage in the agritourism activity. Very generally, this says, I understand that the agritourism provider is not liable for any injury to a participant resulting from an agritourism activity. I accept all risks. Please note um, point number one on the slide here, that there is no liability protection for the agritourism provider if they act in a grossly negligent manner or on purpose or criminally. I mean, that's pretty obvious. I think most of us would assume that, you know, if you're doing something criminal, you're not going to get this liability protection. And I got to apologize to everyone who might be trying to read this ridiculously tiny print. Uh, there's a lot here. I debated putting this information on multiple slides, but I wanted to make it very clear that the written agreement must contain all of this information. And if you're thinking, uh, hey, it might be kind of hard to fit all that wording into a small piece of paper, uh, you're not alone. Just make sure that the written agreement is written in at least 10 point bold font. So, and if you're also concerned, you know, getting people to sign a waiver might be difficult. There's an alternative. Uh, Pennsylvania statute allows agritourism operators to print that, that same agreement and warning language onto a ticket. So two things about the ticket. Uh, the ticket must include all the same language and guests will have to use the ticket to enter the activity. So operators will still need to make sure that they are filtering their guests in a way to the entrance uh, so that they can check and make sure that everyone has a ticket. The fourth requirement for Pennsylvania statute refers to signage. The required warning signs must be posted on the property at conspicuous locations and must be three feet by two feet. The sign should be placed in a way that they're easily observable by the participants of the activity. The language warns that the participants uh, must read the agreement provided by the operator on the ticket or the, the waiver form. And the sign explains to participants that the agritourism operator will not be liable for injuries should the participant be hurt while they're on the farm. So essentially that same language that we saw earlier. The last thing, um, the law states that a parent or guardian must sign the acknowledgement agreement on behalf of a minor or care dependent person. Um, we should note that generally children uh, do not have legal capacity to sign liability waivers and a waiver signed by a child might be voidable. Uh, it's going to be up to the Pennsylvania courts to decide whether this law will have the intended effect when it comes to claims of injuries to minors. 
it's an unsettled legal issue and we'll have to wait and see how the courts deal with this aspect of the law. That said, a parent signed waiver would waive the parent's claim for compensation relating to their child. Now, if you're interested in reading these statutes for yourself, I've provided the links here. I've also included a link to the Pennsylvania Farm Bureau's resource page on agritourism. I recommend it to any agritourism operator who's struggling to figure out the signage aspect of this new law. Uh, and the Farm Bureau has a link where you can buy signs with the proper warning language. It's very convenient. So to summarize, um, any Pennsylvania farmer who's trying to diversify their farm income through agritourism uh, should familiarize themselves with this new state statute and see if they can get this liability protection for their operation. Now, if I went through anything too fast, send me a message in the chat or send me an email and I'll do my best to answer any questions you may have. And last but not least, before I turn things over, the code word for this session is liability. So if you are an attorney, attention attorneys, if you're an attorney hoping to receive CLA credits, please write down the word liability. And that's it. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you very much, Jackie. And uh, Brooke Dewar, the staff attorney at the, at the center, um, will speak now about carbon markets. Um, as well as, uh, as solar development. So uh, Brooke, um, you can go ahead and share your screen and, and get started. Brooke, um, we're, we're having trouble hearing you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we're good now. Okay, sorry about that. I, that's, I was having trouble getting myself all set up properly. Okay, can you see my, my slides? Yes, we can see your slides. All right, good. There we go. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, um, give me one second to just move something out of the way. All right. Now, there we go. All right, so I'm going to talk about two things in this remaining portion of the uh, first hour um, today. And I guess it was already discussed. They're both things arising out of diversification of farm income. Uh, the first is you know, the ever present and you know the thing that we hear so much about carbon markets and carbon contracts and where is this all headed and are we even out of the gate yet? Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about what is emerging as what I think is the most important issue to talk about with regard to solar, particularly here in Pennsylvania. I apologize to our out-of-state uh, people, but I think I'll give you a little background in terms of uh, the unique circumstances going on in Pennsylvania versus some other states in our way of dealing with solar, or perhaps maybe not dealing with solar development. And um, so I think there's a little education in it for out-of-state people too, but I think unique there's a very unique situation here in Pennsylvania that is very worth looking at um, to, to get the big picture. And then I think you can understand maybe uh, a little more of the details uh, uh, on the ground. So let's talk about carbon contracts and carbon markets first. I love this little diagram uh, because basically it's got the two things in it uh, buried in here, plus lots of other stuff. Over here, where the little pile of money is, where it says investment, that's the carbon contract. And over here, where it says credits and it says carbon offset, uh, that's where the market would be. So uh, you have this uh, this sort of uh, cir you know, circular or this route of commerce um, that embodies these two concepts. Uh, and we will just go through it you know, in a very basic way here, just with this diagram to uh, I break this down. I'm not assuming that uh, people, certainly a lot of you know what you're, what you, what this is all about, but for those who don't, um, I just want to make sure that uh, we cover the basics, which is, all right, so what we're looking at here is essentially, let me get my pointer going. There we go. Now we can follow along in the little diagram. So what we basically have here is, uh, okay, so you have carbon emitters already did my uh, uh, usual practice of advancing too fast. We have carbon emitters over here who may be, you know, industrial facilities of this, uh, that look like this, or they may be anything. Uh, could be uh, uh, any business of any kind whatsoever, uh, this being just an example. And you may have one of two reasons that, or maybe both reasons, depending on where they're located, why they would wish to, uh, 
engage in the purchasing of carbon credits in some type of a market, as you see the uh, arrow going here. One would be that they have a voluntary threshold that they're trying to meet uh, for you know, the, the, the feel good, the green, you know, the greening of their business, the, you know, the basic, uh, you know, trend that we see today, which is businesses voluntarily announcing commitments to reduce their carbon emissions and ultimately reach some type of net zero uh, status or better. Um, and so that's a voluntary uh, world that's going on there. Then you have the mandatory reason why somebody might, some business may wish to be purchasing carbon credits of some kind. Uh, in other words, they're under some type of government mandate to uh, reduce their carbon emissions. Now, right now, um, you know, we're mostly dealing with voluntary uh, uh, reasons why uh, businesses may be interested in purchasing some type of uh, carbon credits. Um, but, you know, as this issue continues to develop, we are certainly going to have uh, mandatory government imposed uh, thresholds that start applying. And, you know, some states already have something going on. Pennsylvania, as you know, has, is, is joining the REGI, uh, the Regional Greenhouse Gas uh, What's the what's what's the, what's the I stand for uh, initiative? There you go. Um, so uh, there will be at some point in time uh, some some uh, non voluntary uh, issues uh, occurring in Pennsylvania or some non voluntary thresholds potentially applying to some. All right. So that's why th this even exists. Now uh, they're ready to spend money, as we see in the little pile of money here, to purchase those. And so uh, who would they purchase them from? Well, agriculture, farmers uh, want to get themselves in the position to be the recipients of the stack of money. Uh, and that's where the diversification of income comes into play. And this just gives you a little, ver a little uh, you know, graphic presentation of, the of examples of things that may in fact uh, enable a farm operation or an ag operation to be um, uh, in a position to sell some carbon credits. Um, and then, so, and, and what happens? Well, uh, there is usually some type of a third party in between who's going to uh, in, invest in a contract with the ag operation over here at this side of the little diagram, uh, some type of aggregator or some type of uh, entity that is interested in uh, essentially arming themselves with carbon credits in order to sell on the market down here to one of these guys. So uh, you would have um, some party that would come to an ag operation and say, hey, would you like to enter into a contract whereby I pay you money for carbon that you are sequestering uh, in your soil or that you are um, otherwise uh, you know, saving from being admitted into the environment uh, by the things you do on your farm. And we'll, you know, that's obviously a lot of loaded words there that have lots of aspects to them. And, uh, and so that's where the supplemental income comes in. And then, you know, the contract is the devil is always in the details. And what do these contracts say? And right now they are purely private instruments. So negotiated between the parties uh, without any parameters, at least in Pennsylvania, without any parameters uh, of any kind uh, governing how the carbon savings is measured uh, you know, or any aspect uh, of these contracts. Um, and really nationally, it's, you know, there's, I think there's very few states that have any, uh, have jumped into this at all. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then let's assume that you've complied with this contract. Uh, then the party that has set you up with the contract then attempts to sell uh, those on the, this open market to those parties who need to comply. So that's a little, flow of commerce there. Here's a nice little diagram that I grabbed out of the uh, Rodale um, uh, documents, which just for attorneys who you don't barely even remember uh, what photosynthesis is, here's one example of how carbon gets sequestered in the soil for, soil for which a ag uh, operator would be entitled potentially uh, under the right circumstances uh, to be paid for doing this. Um, for sequestering that carbon in the soil. We have the C and the O2, two oxygen molecules here, and the carbon molecule here that are um, essentially 
uh, being consumed by the plant, uh, you know, for the purpose of uh, photosynthesis. And uh, those, car those it's obviously that's a, that uh, CO2 molecule is broken up through the process of photosynthesis. The C goes down here with some O, but then the O goes out into the environment, um, as we know. And then through all the various decomposition processes that are sort of pictured here, the, the carbon actually is you know, trapped in the soil. And uh, I saw an interesting thing the other day about, there was a little study about the canopy in the rainforest and all the stuff that falls in the nooks and crannies of the trees actually sequesters uh, a lot more carbon than the ground does. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, it's just much richer um, in, in, in what it's doing. Uh, and how quickly and the and the and the concentration of uh, carbon that it that it traps as opposed to soil. But the bottom line is this is the scientific process upon which all of this is based. Um, okay, now as we said in let me go back for a second. As we talked about in this you know diagram, there really is no government involvement in, or very rare instances uh, of any kind of government involvement in this entire operation. This is something that has grown up completely you know, uh, free and separate of any gover government uh, uh, requirements for the most part, uh, you know, just sort of like the internet did. But now, of course, everyone's looking and saying, uh, perhaps we need to have some government intervention or involvement here in order to protect people who are getting into this game of uh, committing to things under contract for which they're being paid um, and uh, is maybe also protecting um, those who are uh, purchasing to make sure that uh, you know they're purchasing an actual real live uh, 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 commodity that has some value that actually that that, that is uh, able to be proven that in fact there was carbon um, that was prevented from being admitted into the atmosphere. Uh, less protection obviously owed to these buyers, more protection felt to be needed for those who were getting into this. Um, but both things are important. And so we get uh, Congress stepping in uh, quite, you know, quite a quite a bit ago. Doesn't it seem like it was a years ago, uh, you know, last spring? But in any event, uh, in July, June of uh, 2021, Cong uh, the U.S. Senate introduced and zoomed through, I mean zoomed, uh, through this bill, the Growing Climate Solutions Act for 2021. And this was the thing that everyone looked at as the um, uh, as the beginning of government involvement in carbon contracts. And so a lot of states sat back at a 92 to eight passage in the US Senate certainly means something in this day and age, or does it? Uh, it's a good question because times certainly have changed since last June. Uh, would this pass uh, 92 to eight today? Hmm, probably not. Um, but in any event, this bill zoomed through the Senate. Everyone was riding high. Everyone had high hopes that this would become law and that all of a sudden some type of order would be restored to this entirely privately regulated circle of commerce that we're talking about here uh, and that there would be some uh, benefits to the public from this new law zooming through Congress. Well, of course, it stopped dead in the U.S. House, has not moved one iota since the day it was delivered to the House, and perhaps it may stay that way. We will have to find out. So what did this do? Well, it seemed to make it easier for farmers to participate in the voluntary carbon contract markets or the car car voluntary carbon credit markets. Um, None of it was mandatory in terms of the way its provisions were written. Everything was completely voluntary with regard to those people that participated in what was being set forth by this act. In other words, uh, you could still have a completely set private transactions that complete this entire circle of commerce here, uh, or you could uh, choose to the various parties, or I should say, the, let's do it this way. Sorry to keep going back and forth. The party who is aggregating these carbon credits and attempting to sell them at this point, um, this law was essentially set forth so that people could enter that uh, part of the market and they would receive sort of the imprimatur or the or the the ability to say, I've been certified by the uh, USDA as a 
um, you know, as a legitimate carbon uh, aggregator and my credits are good and I've had that seal of approval. And that's kind of what it was setting up. Uh, so, you know, what it was, and, and by the way, there was also a study that USDA was to do at hand, but I'm going to go right to it. Okay, uh, let's, let me just, uh, let me see. Okay, so it was going to establish um, voluntary uh, measurement and verification protocols for those uh, carbon credit aggregators who wish to be able to say they are USDA registered, so to speak. And I think um, um, the, I, I forget whether it was, uh, uh, there, there were two, yeah, here we go. There were two, oh, sorry. There were two type of, types of credentials that you could get from uh, this USDA program that, you know, was, uh, that is proposed to, under the act. One is a greenhouse gas technical assistance provider. In other words, those people that are uh, providing advice to a farmer, for example, on uh, how to uh, produce the most activity on your farm that qualifies you for the highest amount of carbon credits, let's say. And then there were the third party verifiers who were going to come in after the contract was signed and make sure that, you know, th that it's legitimately happening, that carbon is in fact being um, sequestered, so to speak, on that farm, and that these uh, carbon credits that are going to be sold or may have already been sold have some basis in fact and are legitimate. So, um, those people would be able, people in those two categories of business uh, would be able to say that they were uh, compliant with USDA requirements. It's sort of a, you know, a, a, it's, some people, you know, like to compare it to the organic standards. I say it's more like the Better Business Bureau. In any event, um, there was going to be the creation of the USDA website um, where these people would essentially be listed. So you'd know, is this person a person who is, you know, uh, okay with the federal government here and they're registered on the USDA website and you go look them up. Um, so you'd know who you're dealing with. So this was for, you know, protect protections, producer protections. And then um, <clears throat> uh, the, uh, you know, there would be essentially requirements for these people, um, you know, to act in good faith and to be essentially engaging in reputable business practices. Um, and so that was essentially the model that would create some degree of uh, reliability that these carbon credits that were produced pursuant to a private contract are, are legit and not just, you know, stand, you know printed on paper uh, without any basis in fact. And so um, that was sort of the model of what was being created. Now, um, the type of carbon credit generating activities that farmers could get into are listed here. There's a long list, you know, and I, I want to make sure we make headway and don't want to go through all of these in, in laborious details. But, you know, it's obviously sequestering in the soil is not, even though I've been concentrating on that, that's obviously not the only way that this can happen. Um, reductions in emissions from anything that you would normally have been doing, doing on the farm and you've now doing it in a new way. Um, so air emissions uh, also from equipment, whatever. Um, livestock emissions, obviously the, you know, bovine, uh, you know, burping uh, is, you know, the, the, the rage in terms of uh, um, the media seems to love to talk about this. Um, and, uh, and also, of course, you know, all types of manure management practices, which uh, may in fact advance the, uh, the ball in terms of reducing uh, carbon emissions into the atmosphere. Um, uh, On-farm energy production, like digesters, et cetera, um, energy feedstock production, if you're, you know, uh, producing something that is being used uh, ultimately to uh, make energy, um, uh, let, let's see, you know, fertilizer, nutrient use, emissions reductions, reforestation. Obviously, at this point in time, I'm not talking about forestry, um, even though it's part of ag, because forestry is actually way out in front of traditional ag. Um, forestry people have, they're, they're at least a year and a half to two years, if not more, ahead of conventional ag or of, of other types of ag um, with regard to their use of carbon contracts. They, they're getting it together a lot quicker. Um, so again, all kinds of, you know, practices that you can do um, uh, on a farm that would uh, potentially qualify you for carbon uh, uh, credits and, and to be paid for that. Now, um, 
Uh, you always have a list of questions that you know, that, and this has sort of been the rage for lawyers to be uh, doing educational materials for producers on, well, what should producers know uh, when they somebody presents them with a carbon contract? And uh, and I put out the, the call to people should share their carbon contracts with me. Uh, I, I don't see them. Uh, I'd love to see them. Uh, any of you in attendance, send them, please. Uh, I have the Indigo contract, which Indigo is a, con a company that is um, uh, offering farmers contracts right now. And frankly, the Indigo contract is atrocious. Uh, and it has very little detail. I mean, it's the last version that I saw. So uh, there is certainly a lot of concern and a lot of need for farmers to be advised as to what it is that they're looking at when somebody presents them with a carbon contract. So this is a list. And thanks to Joel Cape uh, from um, uh, Fayetteville, Arkansas, for this little list written in this way. I, you know, but this this list exists all over the place uh, in very similar ways. Um, but I looked at his list, and so why reinvent the wheel? Um, so, what are you going to be required to do? How long will the contract last? How much are you going to get paid? Uh, when are you going to get paid? What are the consequences uh, if if you have to get out of the contract or just uh, you know you haven't complied in some way, or you're you're going backwards, or your practices have changed, or you've had to change practices, or whatever the situation may be. Um, will there be liens or something on your uh, property as a result of entering into this contract that's going to affect its alienability or your ability to use it as collateral, et cetera? Um, who owns and gets access to all the data that is backing up your your eligibility for the carbon credits? It, you know, is, who's that going to be shared with? Um, you know, and how do you keep that confidential? Um, and then how is it going to be verified that you're in fact doing the things that your contract says you're doing? Um, so lots of detail there that needs to be paid attention to. Um, the uh, uh, last thing, a couple more things that we want to talk about with regard to carbon contracts is the, um, uh, there's a list, Iowa State, University of Nebraska at Lincoln, um, there have been some, you know, academic institutions who have really stepped out in front with regard to the resources that they have published, and here's a list of them. Uh, Illinois, the University of Illinois, uh, Urbana, Champaign, the, the, there's a lot of good stuff out there. So this is just scratching the surface of what's out there. There is so much good material out there to read up on um, that you, it's, it's so easily available and it's really good stuff. Uh, this is one area where the, at the sort of the academic side of, of ag um, has really gotten uh, way out in front and, and done some really nice advanced work to educate people. Now what's happened really, and before I leave this topic, you know, what we've seen since the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the bill being stuck in the U.S. House, but the excitement that the Senate passage produced, um, everyone thought this was going to move in a certain pace. Well, it's basically you know, slowed down to a snail's pace in some respects, not in the forestry sector, but in the ag sector. Um, but just want to provide you with general overview and some details as to, you know, where else you might want to go. This is a really interesting thing that um, I think it was, yeah, University or Colorado State University, whoops, sorry, Colorado State University and USDA teamed up on this website, this Comet Farm uh, website. And what this is, is any farmer can go in there and input data, and it's confidential, with regard to their um, particular operation, and they can start, start to get a sense, and this thing will give them a, essentially a report uh, after they've input and answered all the questions uh, about what kind of carbon uh, credits they may be able to produce from their operation uh, and what the cost may be to institute new things. And... Um, uh, just it's completely just sort of like a, a you know a play, uh, what, what do they call these things a sandbox where you can go in and just you know per, go in and, and play around with it a little bit and see what kind of money you might be able to make uh, from the carbon market. Um, so this is really and there's a bunch of these out there. That's this is just one of them. This is the USDA's version. I'm sure that I've skipped over important parts of carbon contracts in here. One of the buried issues, of course, is this concept of additionality. Additionality means what are you really doing that's different now than what you started doing several years ago? Because you know the idea of, well, when does the clock begin to run with regard to your practices 
And when do you get credit for doing something new? And where's the baseline that you're starting at? And so there's all these issues that surround this concept of additionality. In other words, are you actually doing something additional now that you've signed the contract or are you just doing what you've always done? And where do, where do you start uh, measurement, the, the measurement process uh, of your carbon savings? Okay, that's it on carbon. Now what I wanna talk about is grid scale solar project siting laws and what's going on in Pennsylvania with regard to this issue. What we've seen, and we, last time, the last uh, you know, January, we had a session on solar. We were talking all about leases, the leases, and what's in them and all that sort of stuff. Um, and that's a great issue. But now over you know, the last two years or so of concentrating on that, the issue that we're starting to see in Pennsylvania arise is, it is, is quite interesting. Um, and not to say that all the, you know, the, the complexity and the you know, uh, uh, issues relating to what's in these leases and how they work and all that, that's all very important. But we got another issue going on right now, which is, um, this is still you know, an industry completely in its infancy, particularly in Pennsylvania here. Pennsylvania right now, of the 62 active solar projects that have been approved for being to be uh, essentially hooked up to the grid by this PGM, P excuse me, PJM Interconnect. That's the organization that essentially gives somebody approval to say, okay, if you generate this new, this new electricity, we'll let you hook up to the grid and supply it. Um, 62 such projects have been approved. Only seven of them, seven of them are even operational uh, in Pennsylvania. This is 62 have been approved in Pennsylvania. I'm talking strictly Pennsylvania here now. Um, so we have all kinds of things in the pipeline, people that want to sign leases and do things, but only seven of them are actually work are actually running right now and producing electricity. Now, the question becomes, how are these sites being selected? Well, right now it's the Wild West. This is completely a private uh, matter between a private landowner and a privately owned and operated solar um, developer of some kind. Um, so who has a hand in selecting the sites? Solar developer, sure, they're one of the private entities. Private landowner, sure, they're one of the private entities. Government entity, in Pennsylvania right now, th that's more than a question mark. The answer is no. They do not have much of a hand in selecting. Uh, certainly at the federal level, um, there has not been, uh, there, excuse me, I keep doing that. There has not been standards uh, with regard to uh, solar siting and what are appropriate sites or what and what aren't or any type of regulation in that regard. At the state level in Pennsylvania, we have nothing like that. So what we have done is we have left it all to the local zoning hearing boards, boards of supervisors, and whoever does their uh, land development plan review and approval. Um, so let's stop back, get back up a second, just talk about this. The leasing model is what has emerged in solar, you know, where a developer comes in and spends tens of millions of dollars to build a solar array on property they don't even own. It's essentially a power plant on property they don't even own. Uh, and they're pledging it as collateral for the capital to finance this entire operation. Well, that's a lot of risk that's resting on some pretty thin, you know, legal uh, uh, underpinnings, let's just say. Uh, doesn't seem like a very good business model. You know, why is this being done? Why this leasing model? And it's not just Pennsylvania, it's everywhere. But the reason why this is happening this way, rather than, you know, a solar developer buying property and going forward uh, like anybody else would who's going to be building a power plant, um, is because the regulatory environment is in a, such a complete state of complete flux. Um, in Pennsylvania's case, the regulatory, it, it, the regulatory environment is basically non-existent. There is no PUC regulation of any kind. They don't even know who these solar developers are. It's simply a private deal between them and um, the PJM Interconnect, which is who owns it, which is a collective of the utilities that owns and operates uh, the grid. Um, uh, but this conduct of them purchasing from somebody uh, is not a regulated activity under the PUC code in Pennsylvania. So the Public Utility Commission has no involvement, no involvement from DUP, no DEP, no other state agency is involved in any way, shape or form with regard to the siting decision. 
So everything rests with the local townships. And you, you, those of us in Pennsylvania know that we have thousands upon thousands of townships. Now, why is this uh, a problem? Well, uh, it's very discouraging to the solar industry um, to have no regulatory structure at all, because then it's just a you know, thousands upon thousands, a patchwork, so to speak, of regulatory um, uh, uh, structures that that tell you whether, in fact, this plant can get built with this, excuse me, this uh, solar project can get built or not. Um, and, you know, Pennsylvania has traditionally been quite a hotbed of transmission line, electrical transmission lines to the, you know, uh, megalopolis. Uh, you know, I think what was the, is that the term that used to be go on for the, the stretch between Boston and, and, and DC? Um, you know, basically an electrical power, unless you have, you know, the odd power plant somewhere in the Northeast or whatever, it's all going through Pennsylvania to get there, you know, and, and to a lesser extent, Virginia to get to the DC area. But the bottom line is, we've always been an electricity transmitter through here. We have the grid. We have the grid here. We have the transmission lines. This is that a solar developer. That's what they want. They don't want to put solar projects out in Wyoming and Colorado and Nebraska, you know, and Kansas, where the transmission lines are hundreds of miles away. We have them all here. We should be leading this thing if in fact there is a desire. Uh, but of course that's you know uh, not for me to say, uh, but the bottom line is it's an observation that we have the transmission lines. We should be the most attractive place to, to be uh, building to feed the East Coast electricity um, and to contribute to the East Coast electricity. Let's just say, it, put it that way. But that is not what our regulatory environment is fostering. Um, in fact, what our regulatory environment or the absence of regulation is fostering is this development pressure on farmland because the most attractive land for solar development is always that which is flat, level, and already cleared, farmland. So we have inadvertently perhaps created an undue pressure on farmland by not getting involved as a state government at a policy level in the siting choices. Other states have, and I know we're running out of time here, Ross. I will just say that if you want to take a look at what other states have done, New York uh, just recently, you know, effective in April, but they only did their regs in March of this year. This was April of last year. They just passed a solar siting law, um, and Ohio just did one. Um, they had a thing called the Power Siting Board, but now it deals with these solar projects too and the various provisions. So. The, the issue in Pennsylvania or an issue in Pennsylvania in the next couple of years is going to be, are we going to get some kind of siting controls from the state level or are we going to leave it to this patchwork of township uh, local officials, which I certainly feel bad for the local officials if in fact they end up being uh, the, the only ones with the authority to influence siting decisions. But right now, that's where we are. All right, Ross, I will, I will. I will, I, will, Brooke, I will go ahead. Sure. And Brooke, Brooke had mentioned the um, REGIE or the Regional Greenhouse Cash Initiative. And, and uh, that certainly has been a lot of um, opposition or that's been, been somewhat controversial. The, the General Assembly had passed a resolution disapproving the, um, the regulation um, that authorized entry. And I, I think the latest on that is that uh, earlier this week, I, I believe um, Governor Wolf vetoed that uh, that legislation. So we'll we'll have to see what what happens um, on on that issue. Um, there's a, a question um, for carbon markets and contracts. Any thoughts about including force majeure clauses in a carbon market? Um, how about ensuring credits are sold once but not more? Are there any effective tracking systems? Right. Those are, yeah, the, the sold once but not more, obviously, that's a big concern. Um, you know, when you have no ability to verify and no ability to, you know, for anyone to get involved in trying to determine if these are legitimate businesses who are selling these things uh, and, you know, signing people up to contracts. I am not aware of either of, of, of much discussion on either of these two points, Laura. Sorry about that. But I, not to say that it's not out there. Um, 
I just don't know. Uh, and of course, the force majeure issues, you know, you, yeah, when you're dealing with the natural forces of biology, uh, you know, to produce this economic benefit to you, just like farmers do all the time, um, this is just another one where, gee, is, you know, farmers don't have enough uncertainty with, you know, the, you know, with the, you know, the climate and, um, and now all of a sudden, oh, the other way you're going to make money is also completely at the mercy of, you know, some biological forces that you might, you may not be able to control. So uh, once again, uh, you know, that's the lot of farmers, I guess. Okay, um, I think that takes us to two o'clock. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Brooke and, and Jackie. We'll, we'll take a 15 minute break. And when we reconvene, we will discuss uh, environmental issues.